بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد this بإذن الله تعالى this درس that we're about to begin is a درس in فقه السنة meaning the أحكام that we get from a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the fiqh the understanding of the religion, the fiqh, the, the, the rulings that are obtained from hadith and we're going to predominantly uh, use and have this use uh, the book Taysir uh, al-Alam min Shaykh uh, Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman al-Bassam rahimahullah ta'ala as an explanation from the kitab Umdat al-Ahkam so this is an explanation by Shaykh Ali Bassam rahimahullah ta'ala of a very important book in Ahkam and it's a book which is before Bulugh Amram. It has less hadith than the, the book Bulugh Amram which is translated into English and is also an incredibly benefit beneficial book. The difference and what is beneficial especially about this book on the Ahkam is the hadith the ahadith that are contained in it are from Bukhari and Muslim and, and other than Bukhari and Muslim but uh, all the hadiths are mutafakun alay. So then you don't have to worry about the authenticity of these hadith. So we'll begin as the ulama begin with the Kitab Tahara, the Kitab of Purification. And the scholars, they mention Kitab Tahara in the beginning of their uh, books regarding fiqh and hadith related to ahkam because Kitab Tahara, because Tahara is a is the miftah salat. It is the key to Salat is one of the shurut or one of the conditions for prayer is Tahara. So this is why the ulama, they begin with Kitab Tahara. So in our study of this book, we're going to just try to uh, get through the uh, book, the Kitab Tahara, and we will, every, every time we have a dars, we'll go through several hadith and some of the main benefits of those hadith. We're not going to go into depth. We're not going to busy ourselves too much with the ikhtilaf of ulama and the madahib, but rather we're just going to take some of the basic rulings and benefits to give us, as beginning students of knowledge, to give us uh, an idea of the meaning of these hadith and some of the benefits we can attain, obtain from them regarding uh, practicing our religion. And so the Shaykh, uh, Shaykh Maqtasi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he began Kitab Tahara, Hadith al Awwal, which is a hadith of Amir al Mu'mineen, uh, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. An Amir al Mu'mineen, Abi Hafs Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, qal, Sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a yakul, Inma al Malu bin Niyat, wa inma al Kulimrin manawa. Faman kana al Hijjatu ila Allahi wa Rasuli, fa Hijjatu ila Allahi wa Rasuli. ومن كان حجة للدنيا يسيبها مرات ينكحها فهجة ولا ما هجرا إليه رواه بخاري ومسلم. In this hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, which is the hadith of Amir al-Mu'minin, Abi Hafs Umar bin al-Khattab رضي الله تلا عنه. Umar said, I heard the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say, Verily, actions are tied to the intentions, and everyone will get that for which he intended. Therefore, he who migrates for Allah and his messenger has migrated for Allah and his messenger. And he who migrates for some worldly gain or to take a woman in marriage, then he has migrated, then he will get that for which he migrated for. And it's collected in Bukhari and Muslim in this hadith. There are so many uh, benefits and the ulama say that this is one of the hadith that is pertaining to the foundation of the religion that around this hadith is more than 70 chapters in fiqh. And the reason, one of the reasons they say this is because this has to do with the intention, letting us know that all ibadah in Islam, anything that we consider worship, there are two conditions for our worship to be accepted. The first one is that we have correct intention, meaning niya. Our intention is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we're worshiping Allah alone, and we're doing it for the sake of Allah, to barak wa ta'ala, to seek His pleasure. The second condition is that the, hadith, uh, that the action is in conjunction with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So, for example, if a person wants to pray, 
and their intention is uh, they have an intention to please Allah. They're praying only to Allah. There's no shirk in their ibadah. And they want to please Allah and they, they're, they're praying to Allah. However, they decide to face other than the Qibla. You know, other than the Kaaba in Mecca. Or they pray without Tahara, which is even more befitting for what we're studying right now. They pray and they don't have wudu. Although their intention is correct, is sahih, that act is not acceptable because they didn't meet both of those conditions we mentioned, which is first is ikhlas in your niya, sincerity to Allah, and the second one is that mutaba'ah, that is following the Prophet wasallam. that the way that they prayed and did this act of worship is how the Prophet Muhammad wasallam worshipped. So those are the two conditions, and that's an example of how a person can have a correct intention, but yet their act of their act of ibadah is not accepted because they didn't follow the sunnah. And likewise, uh, vice versa, if a person follows the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, but their intention is not correct, they they are praying, they're facing the qibla, they have a tahara purification from the major and the minor impurities, they, uh, you know. They are, 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 are doing all those acts, all the conditions of Salat are there in place. They're praying like the Prophet wasallam with the Arkana Salat and the uh, Wajibat of Salat and so forth. You know, Takbir to Ihram and all, all the things are there in place, but their intention is not for Allah. Meaning they're showing off for the people, that's a type of Riyā and it could be the major shirk sometimes, depending if they're... How, how and when this act uh, they're showing off is and how to what degree it is or it can be uh, they could just have their niya could be solely to worship someone's to worship one of their ajdad for example they could be praying on the grave of one of the saints or praying say this is for Abdul Qadir Jilani I'm praying to him so that he will carry my salat to Allah or I'm praying to Abdullah Haredi because he was a, a righteous muhaddith, according to their claim, and his uh, uh, that this will he will carry my ibadah because he was one of, the, one of the salihin, and me I'm a person of sin. This is the concept that we have from many of people, many people from the ummah, wallahu musta'an, and this will also negate that act of worship. Why? Because the intention wasn't sound. And although they followed the sunnah in general, but they didn't have ikhlas, they didn't have sincerity to Allah. And the hadith that we mentioned is all about that. It's all about sincerity and ikhlas to have the correct intention, meaning that every action that a person does, it there's a relationship with their intention. And every act of worship that a person tries to do, that it must have the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of whether it be salat, zakat, fasting, uh, hajj, whatever, all of those acts, they require that we have the correct intention. Another thing that's uh, important w regarding the intention in general, and scholars have done res you know immense amount of research talking about the intention, and there's so many things we could talk about re related to fiqh, and Qawaid Fiqiyya and things like this. But however, as I mentioned, we're going to keep it short. Uh, one of the benefits of the intention is that the intention distinguishes um, it distinguishes habits between ibadah. Al-adat to me is al-adat wa ibadat. Bain al-ibadat. Al-adat wa ibadat. The intention of something distinguishes between something being a habit and something being a or, or a custom of the people and worship. For example, if a person says they, they go in right now and they do all the acts of wudu, but their intention is just to wash those limbs. They wash their hands, they want to wash out their mouth, they felt some stuff in their nose, they cleaned out their nose, they wash their face, their ears, their hair. Uh, they wash their arms and their feet and so forth. All the, the parts of wudu. But they did it in order just to clean those things. 
that shows that that's adet. That would fall under adet. What is going to distinguish that between making wudu, which makes it uh, makes it permissible to pray, is the intention. So the intention distinguishes between that and that. Another example. What about when we want to pray dhur or salat al-asr? The only way we can distinguish between dhur and asr, because both of them are salat that we don't recite out loud, the recitation. We, they both are four rakat, you know, four units of prayer. And they, they resemble each other tamaman in every respect, except for, of course, the time. But what distinguishes them, the only thing that's going to distinguish them is the intention, your niya. That your niya was to pray the dhuhr, salat. Or when to the time for salat al-asr came in, your niya was to pray salat al-asr. You need the, so the niya also distinguishes ibadat min ibadat. It distinguishes one type of, uh, of worship from another type of worship. The thing that makes it, uh, distinguishes it, is your intention. And likewise, the person who, who fast, um, uh, maybe if they fast, you know, and it's about a diet or something like this, it's a, like this, and they fast the same Sharia fast, but their intention was not to please Allah, then it's not accepted. That would not be considered fast. Even if they did all the same, act, they, they restrained from food and drink and from lawful relations and all those things, it would not be considered fast unless the intention was involved. So the niya distinguishes between habits and ibadah, and it also distinguishes between the various types of ibadah. So those are one of the things. Some other benefits that the Sheikh mentions in this is it shows us that also the, the niya also uh, determines whether an action of worship is sound and uh, authentic or whether it is uh, facade or it's facet, meaning that it is um, that it is uh, that it is basically unacceptable. Okay, whether you're, if a salat is fasted, that means it's battle, that means it's not accepted, it's not a prayer that's acceptable because something was left out that is an arkan of the salat or something like this, or a shirut or a condition for the salat, meaning like tahara and so forth. Uh, but all of this, uh, re regarding the intention, the intention, regard uh, many, many things related to the hukum of someone's ibadah are related to the intentions. Whether their salat, whether an act of ibadah is sound or not, related to the intention. Whether it's complete or not, is related to the intention. Whether it's, it's uh, 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 even things of obedience and disobedience, it all comes to intention. It all relates to the intention, so it's very important. For example, someone who um, they do you know, they seek knowledge, for example, and they seek it to show off for the people. Then this, although it's a great deed of seeking knowledge, this is alim, it's one of the greatest forms of ibadah that we can do after the wajibat, you know, and especially it can be the wajib if it is related to the wajibat. That it's one of the greatest acts of ibadah that we can do, but it depends on the intention. If someone's intention is facet, the deed is facet. If they did it to please the people, they did it to be heard of the people, heard from the people, then that uh, ibad of Talib al -Aum will not benefit them. Matter of fact, it will be against them, as the Prophet wasallam said in another hadith, which relates to the intention. He mentioned the, the three, in al awwal nas yuqda alayhi yomul qiyama rajul ustushida. And then the second one was the person who so the first one was a martyr. The second one was a, a talib al ilm or a scholar, or a person who who um, uh, read read the Quran beautifully. All of that related to the intention that those great acts could either get the person reward because it can be an act of ta'a, obedience to Allah, or it could be an act of ma'asi because they did it to show off to the people. And in in the in that particular hadith. All of those great acts of ibadah, the people did it, <clears throat> the mujahid, he fought and he was martyred for the sake so that the people would remember him and say that he was brave. 
the the stu the, the the scholar. He sought the knowledge so that the people would say that he was an alim. He was a great scholar. And, and it was said about him, so he was dragged into the hellfire. And the last one was a person who spit sadaqah. And the people said about him, what a great, generous person. That, that was his reward. His reward was that praise in the dunya. And in the hereafter, he received a terrible punishment. And that was all related to what? Related to the intention. Related to the niyyah. Some of the other benefits of this hadith is that uh, the niya or the intention is one of the uh, conditions for our deeds as we mentioned before we mentioned that the first one is that your intention is correct it's to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the second one is that it's in accordance with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam another uh, important benefit we gain from this hadith is that this hadith also indicates for us that the niya mahal hal qalb that your intention, the place of the intention is the heart. This is what the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, in the books of Ahl Sunnah of Creed, you'll find all throughout the books that they say the place of the intention is your heart. It's not on your tongue. So you don't have to say when you're getting ready to pray Salat al -Dur, I'm praying Salat al -Dur. it's going to be four rakat, and I'm following the Imam, this is my intention, Allahu Akbar. No, you hear some people do this. This is bid'ah. This is a mistake that they're doing, and it's a bid'ah, it's a religious innovation. Because as the ulama uh, mentioned through all the books, throughout the books, you'll find they say the niya mahalaha al that the mahal or the place of the niya uh, of the intention is the heart. So we don't have to talaf you know, talaf bin niya. We don't have to mention on our tongues the intention. And even Hajj, and some people will come back and say, hey, what about Hajj? You make the Talbiyah. For one, the Talbiyah is not to left of the Niya. Your Niya is to enter the Nusuk, to enter the Hajj. That is your Niya, that's the Ihram, Sahih. Is that it's your intention. But the Talbiyah is a type of uh, a Dhikr and it's a type of Ta'bir. But it is not, you're not making... You're not mentioning your niya. It's not for your niya. Okay, labayk, Allahumma labayk, and so forth. This is not uh, the niya. So the niya, mahalaha, is the place of the niya is the heart. That's another benefit we gain from this hadith. This hadith also, uh, another important thing is it also shows that it's an obligation to protect ourselves from showing off and from trying to seek fame. Especially when it comes to religious matters. That's a very great sin and it can destroy your deeds in this life. And then in the hereafter you'll be one of the khasirin. Another important thing is that we should always check our intention. And that, that's another benefit of this hadith. And the last benefit that I'm going to mention that Sheikh Ali Bassam mentioned. And he mentioned so many other great ones. But we want to kind of get through these hadith. Uh, he mentioned that the hijra about the hijrah because in this hadith uh, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned hijrah and that this hadith also illustrates for us that the hijrah from leaving the land of shirk to come to the land of Islam is one of the greatest types of ibadah that a person can do if their intention is to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned in the hadith and it's not to take some woman in marriage, that you're moving to a land, leaving from the land of Shirk to the land of the Muslim because you want to get married. Or you're leaving the land of uh, disbelief to the land of Tawheed to just for business purposes or what have you. That was your sole intention. What we learn is that the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what makes it ibadah and what makes it uh, something that will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then moving on to the next hadith, the second hadith, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يقبل الله صلاة أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضأ رواه بخاري. In this hadith, the hadith of Abi Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه, which is a hadith which makes clear for us the obligation of making purification of tahara for salat. And that purification is one of the conditions for our prayer. 
So in this hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah does not accept the prayer of one of you uh, if he makes hadith until he performs wudu. So hadith here, this is referring obviously to hadith al-asgar, meaning the minor impurity uh, meaning those things which break a person's wudu. So not the major impurity. The major impurity would be, for example, a woman, her having her period and, and, and needing. That is one of the major impurities that she must make ghusl. She must uh, make the, the, take a bath or a shower to remove those impurities and, and, and wash her private parts. Also, if a person... Uh, if they uh, if they have relations, if they have relations, or that sperm or discharge comes from the woman, then these are the major some of the major impurities in which a person is going to have to take a shower, uh, the Islamic mashroor, you know, to wash themselves ghusl by making their intention and washing their nose and their mouth and then the rest of their body. That's the minimal requirement for a ghusl. So that's for the major impurity. In this hadith, it was mentioned the minor impurity because he's talking about, the Prophet ﷺ said, said, until they make wudu, that a person's prayer is not accepted if they uh, have the major impurity until they make wudu. And the, I'm sorry, the minor impurity. So the minor impurity are things like what? Things like, uh, urinating, uh, defecating, also uh, passing gas, things like this. These are the minor impurities which require wudu. When a person uh, do, does these things, if they want to pray, to, if they want to pray, then they must make wudu. So from this, the, from this hadith of the Prophet wasallam, we gain uh, several benefits, and the most important benefit being that a person's prayer is absolutely not accepted if they don't have tahara. Meaning that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned wudu, but also in other hadith, and also in the Qur'an, is mentioned tayammum. So if they don't have water, then they, of course they can go to tayammum. They can use dirt, clean earth, and uh, perform tayammum, and then they will be, it will be permissible for them to pray. This hadith shows us that the asl, that the 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 the, the, the going back to the origin of of tahara and purity is water, water and purification. Water is pure, and it purifies uh, other than it. So water itself is in and of itself is pure, and it purifies others, uh, other things. So water, we use water to get rid of najasa, and we use water to make our ghusl. We make water, we use water to make wudu as well. So water purifies as well as being pure. Uh, another benefit, so this shows us the, the salat is absolutely batil. If a person prays without tahara, if they don't, if they don't have wudu for their prayer, and they don't have tayammum, of course. But this is letting us know about wudu. And this, this means also, this doesn't mean that their reward is less. It means it's absolutely not uh, accepted. So this relates to the siha, siha salat the authenticity or the, the correctness of the salat, the soundness of a person's prayer is related to this purification. That if they don't have their, puri, uh, their purification, then their salat is absolutely not uh, accepted. This hadith also is evidence that tahara is one of the conditions for a person's prayer from amongst the various conditions. Mean some of the conditions for prayer are that a person has to have their niya, uh, their intention correct to to to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa taala and and so forth. They also, another condition is that they have to face the Qibla. They have to have Tahara from the uh, major and minor uh, uh, impurities. 
they also have to, as we mentioned, face the Qibla. They have to, uh, they have to have uh, their intention. They also another um, shart from shuru to salat is that they should be sane and that they should, uh, of course, be a Muslim. That the place of prayer should be clean and their garments should be clean. So those are some of the conditions for uh, for prayer, and tahara being one of them. Moving on to the third hadith, and maybe we'll end there. Al hadith al thalith an Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As wa Abi Huraira wa Aisha radiyallahu taala anhum qalu qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wailu al aqab min al nar rawu Bukhari wa Muslim. In this hadith, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As wa Abi Huraira wa Aisha radiyallahu taala anhum jamian. They said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, "Woe to woe to the ankles from the fire, or be cautious of your ankles from the fire." In this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this hadith illustrates for us that the the caution to be cautious of shortcomings in our wudu and that the ankles are a part of the uh, places that we have to purify uh, 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 that we have to purify for our prayer they are from the limbs of wudu so in this hadith the prophet sallallahu said be cautious of the uh, woe to the to you know keep Safeguard your ankles from the hellfire, basically what it means. And this hadith was in relation to some uh, companions, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in, who were making their wudu, and the Prophet sallallahu saw them, and some, or perhaps one of them, had not uh, got his, or a, a man, he didn't get his, didn't clean his leg properly. So the Prophet ﷺ warned them with a stern warning because the term wail, it means it's a, a word used for if something is, is related to a severe punishment or severe torment or that a person will be destroyed and what have you. So this term is used to, as a stern warning to either stay away from some something or, uh, or some sin or to be cautious about something, of not falling into something. In this case, to be cautious about missing any of your limbs that are needed to uh, to be clean for your wudu, uh, during wudu. And so the Prophet ﷺ warned us not to be casual and lazy with regards to making wudu and to wash all of our limbs. Uh, this is... I asked one of the, the scholars about this, what if a person, obviously if a person does this with knowledge, they miss this part, uh, uh, miss one of their limbs for wudu, their wudu is not complete, and their their prayer, because this is a, a condition for the prayer, their prayer is not accepted. But if someone, maybe they were a new Muslim or whatever, and they miss this, maybe they might be uh, considered ma'dur or excused due to ignorance in the matter, that they didn't know that they had to purify that particular limb in that way or they missed a, a spot and Allah knows best. So the one of the most important things we gain from this hadith is that this hadith gives us, uh, lets us know that there is a very severe warning for missing, for having shortcomings in a person's wudu and that we should be very cautious with the wudu. Also, it shows us that there's a, uh, it's an obligation to uh, wash the legs uh, during wudu. And this differs, this is with ijma of the ummah. Those people who differ with the ummah, like the Shia, they say that it's permissible to uh, just to wipe over your, uh, your legs, to wipe over your feet. 
and this goes against the ijma of the Salaf and the Shia, of course. This is why you'll find in many of the books of Ittaqad, of Creed, you'll find some of these issues in there, especially about wiping over the Khufain, wiping over the socks and so forth, because it Ahl Sunnah, the early scholars, the Salaf, because of the dealing with the Shia and other sects that went against wiping over the socks, saying it's not permissible and so forth, the Ahl Sunnah began to put it in their books of Creed as a refutation and also showing that this is one of the signs of Ahl Sunnah is that they follow what the Prophet Sallallahu said was permissible, permissible and what the Prophet Sallallahu did this is from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi that he wiped over the socks that it's permissible to wipe over the Khufain and so this is why you'll find in the books in many of the books of Creed like the books like uh, Shara Sunnah Imam Babahari and other books you'll find a section mentioning Khufain, and this book is predominantly a book of Aqidah. So you, you say, why is this? Why? Because this began to become a mesala, not just of, of fiqh, but also an issue that had a relationship with creed or minhaj, because uh, of methodology. And this is because that those groups that differed in Aqidah, they began to go astray with regards to this issue of wiping over the khufs. And those are just, anyway, some of the uh, benefits that the uh, Sheikh Ali Bassam mentioned regarding this hadith, hadith number three. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.